This episode of The Edge is brought to you by Audible.com, offering more than 180,000 titles for smartphone, tablet, and desktop. To get a free audiobook of your choice and help Trek.fm at the same time, visit audibletrial.com slash trek.fm. And also by Enterprise in Space, an international program of the nonprofit National Space Society. Find out how you can help science and education and become a virtual crew member aboard the NSS Enterprise Orbiter by visiting enterpriseinspace.org. And if you want to join the conversation and share your thoughts on this episode, join the Babel Conference, our listeners group on Facebook. Just type B-A-B-E-L into the Facebook search field. We look forward to seeing you there. You're listening to Trek FM. What have you done out there on the edge of Federation space? Welcome, everyone, to Notes from the Edge, a subshow of our Star Trek Discovery podcast, The Edge. I'm C. Brian Jones, or Chris, and I'll be your host as we flip through the pages of our notebook. In Notes from the Edge, we'll explore connections between Discovery and the greater Star Trek universe, which includes the prior six TV series and 13 films, as well as the massive literary universe, because there are many elements from there that are being worked into the series. And we'll also delve deeper into some of the unique ideas being presented in Discovery. I kick off each episode of Notes with my thoughts on the latest episode of Discovery, which this time means Lethe. I have a lot of small connections to cover, some long, some short, and two points that I want to go into in greater detail. Altogether in this episode, I'll touch on six main points. The ash Vokler theory, things and places mentioned, including the USS Baran, Grazer, and Euridia, the holodeck, logic extremists, and the concept of the Katra, which will be the main focus of the notes section. But I'll start with the sixth of those main points, which is the meaning of the title, Lethe. This is a really interesting one. I love titles, particularly when they have some deeper meaning that you can unravel. And this one has many possible connections to the story. It was great to get this really short title after some of the very long ones that we had, which were really cool and creative. But this one really makes you think about what's going on in the episode. In Greek mythology, Lethe is the name of the daughter of Eris. The word Lethe means oblivion or forgetfulness. And interestingly, since Lethe is Eris's daughter, Eris means strife, which also fits in well with this story. Lethe is also the name of a river in Hades. And in the mystical Greek religion Orphism, It was believed that those who drank from the river Lethe would forget their past lives. There is also a belief in Orphism that we carry a soul that survives the death of our bodies. Of course, we have that idea in other religions as well. But in the case of Orphism, it was a pre-existing soul because there was an element of reincarnation involved. And the soul could be passed along and then brought back. So it's a nice connection to the idea of the Vulcan Katra. And I'll come back around to Katras a bit later. So I think this title is brilliant. And as I was thinking about how it applies to the episode, I can see it applying to Burnham and Sarek as they try to deal with their past, and especially to Burnham. If you look at the final scene when she reintroduces herself to Tyler, it's as if she made a decision to forget her past. You could say that Sarek's memory is the river Lethe, and Burnham drank from it in this episode to forget her past. It could also apply to Lorca. He is someone fighting not to forget his past at the same time that those memories are destroying him. And it could certainly apply to Tyler. I think it adds fuel to the fire of the Ash Vokler theory. In this case, it seems quite literal. I do believe that Ash Tyler is Volk. But I don't think he knows that he is Vogue. It seems that he has truly forgotten his past. Okay, so let's talk more about that. In the last episode of Notes, I laid out my theory that Ash Tyler is Vogue. 
My main argument against it was based on language. Some listeners have suggested that the Klingons transplanted the memories and personality of a real Starfleet officer named Ash Tyler into Voke, and that is why he behaves and speaks so naturally as a human. Captain Revo on Twitter was the first to mention it to me, and I dismissed it at the time as being a bit of a stretch. Well, I I didn't exactly dismiss it entirely because I said anything is possible. I do believe pretty much anything is possible. But it seemed unlikely to me. After a bit more discussion in the Babel Conference and a week to ponder it, I think this could be what is going on, at least in a way. Given that these writers are mining past Star Trek from all over the place, not just on screen, I got to thinking about past Klingon things that I've read, and then I remembered the comic series that Matthew and I did on Literary Treks 41 almost four years ago. That's an episode of Literary Treks that we titled, How Kirk Kept Screwing Up Our Family. And if you read the comic, you'll understand why. But the comic that we covered is called Blood Will Tell, and it's a rundown of famous encounters between the Klingons and the Federation, ones we know from TV episodes, but told from the Klingon perspective. Of particular note is their side of the trouble with Tribbles, which is told in Chapter 2, Beneath the Skin. The story opens with a Klingon woman called Ka'alin and her grandfather, Kanra, battling with Batleths. He begins telling her a story about a Klingon spy. And since you don't have the comic in your hand, I'm sure, I'll read a bit of it. Kanra begins, and he says, Listen, granddaughter, and perhaps we both can learn a lesson in the unfortunate tale of Graumik and the mistakes that led to his own dishonor. Graumik was a cousin in our family, distantly related to our house, although, truth be told, some of that distance was emotional. You see, Graumik was a machgot. Every once in a great while, one is born, small in stature, small in strength, while a family need not live in shame at the birth of a machgot, as you might imagine, neither are they welcome. To his credit, Graumik struggled to defeat the limits of his size, but while the spirit was resolute, the flesh was unwilling. For a warrior, no credit is given for mere effort, and one who tries valiantly and fails is still no less a failure. As the great Kalos wrote, opportunity is the partner of every warrior, if only he is wise enough to meet it. When the day came for opportunity to meet Graumik, and then we switched to some dialogue. You've all been selected from your various battalions to listen to a proposition. What we would ask of you goes far beyond what we have asked of any warrior. That which we would ask is very dangerous, excruciatingly painful, and could potentially rob you of all that which you are though it will allow you to bring great glory to the empire. He rose to meet it, and Graumik said, I volunteer. So I'll just pause for a second and ask, does any of this sound familiar? It could rob you of all that you are, but it could bring you glory. It's a bit what Laurel said to Volk. So we move on to the mission log of Graumik, and he says, Finally, a chance to prove myself in the eyes of my family and the Empire. I was quickly escorted off to a series of briefings about my new mission, working for Klingon Intelligence. The agents of Klingon Intelligence briefed me on the details of the aborted war between the Empire and the Federation. The Organians had interfered, halting the conflict and preventing the Empire from crushing the Federation. The Klingon Empire would not be allowed to engage its Federation enemies in natural, warlike confrontation. Now we're back to dialogue. And a Klingon general says, The Organians allow expansion of the Empire only through peaceful means. Humans and Klingons are now competing under the terms of the Organian Peace Treaty to prove which can better develop the agricultural and economic potential of disputed planets. Battle and glory to be replaced by 
farming and shopkeeping intolerable. The High Council was driven nearly insane with frustration at the terms of the treaty. Surely you don't doubt the Empire is superior. We have no doubts. That is not the issue. This arrangement stifles the Empire. Young Klingon warriors now must become bureaucrats and administrators. How can the Empire circumvent the treaty and gain an advantage over the Federation? How can we allow a generation of Klingons to retain its honor? The Organians seem omnipotent. The High Council has decided that espionage is the answer. A Klingon will infiltrate the ranks of Starfleet's Planetary Development Corps. If his mission results in the successful sabotage of a disputed planet, then a vast army of undercover Klingon agents will follow. Such covert operations are not in our nature, but if the terms of the Organian Peace Treaty demand it, we will adapt. Just as you too shall adapt, Graumek. So, the situation is a bit different. But if what we think is going on with Ash Tyler is true, the goal's a bit similar. Create a Klingon who looks like a human to infiltrate the Federation, to infiltrate Starfleet. So now we switch back to Graumek's mission log. He says, I was to be the first of this new army of saboteurs. In order to infiltrate Starfleet, my appearance was going to have to change. I needed to look like a human. I had no idea, however, just what my metamorphosis would involve. Bear down, Gromick, and we'll finish this as swiftly as we're able. And as best you can, try not to scream. We will be trying to concentrate. And he's surrounded by four Klingons with some nasty-looking tools. The forehead ridge and brow are sanded down to simulate the smaller human head. The skin is burned with acid on all surfaces to lighten the pigment to a pale, sickly, human pallor. Thousands of hair drillings are implanted into the forehead to simulate a more human hairline. The ridges on the spine are shaved to achieve the smooth, featureless human back. And if you could see what they're doing to him, they have them on this operating slab, and they've pulled the skin off of his skull and restitched it together. It's really quite disgusting. So on the next page, it continues. The recovery from the surgeries took eight weeks. The pain was excruciating, but no more than any Klingon warrior would gladly bear in service to the Empire. Far worse, though, was the fact that I no longer felt like a Klingon. Now we're back to dialogue. Patient Graumick, are you still letting your wounds rule your life? I am recovering adequately from the butchery of you and your hacksaws, doctor. I will confess that I look forward to the day when I can be restored to my proper Klingon form. This procedure is not reversible, Graumick. I assumed you realized this. You will always look like a human now. What, you filthy hattaba? The procedure stretched the boundaries of Klingon medicine as it is, Graumick. Klingons are warriors, not cosmetic surgeons and nursemaids. Besides, this operation was difficult enough. Trying to make it reversible would have complicated it even more. We managed to make you look human on the outside. Disguising your identity on the inside was more difficult. There was no way to cloak your more substantial ribcage, significantly larger heart, and three lungs. To avoid detection on your mission, you must take care to avoid letting the humans do a deep medical scan on you. Next, though, while your scars heal, we need to teach you how to act like a human. And Graumick recalls, first they introduced me to human food, boiled mushy vegetables, gelatin, and frozen milk with sugar. Tojoka! Humans eat like infants! I needed to learn to cover my distaste as I choked down every sickeningly sweet bite. Earthers have no taste, it seems, for fresh, live food. All right, so then they go on and they teach him how to shake hands and and do other things. And then they send him off on his mission, and he understands that his mission is to meet Arn Darvin and then kill Arn Darvin and assume his identity. All right, so that was a, a lot of reading that I did there, and the reason I went on so long was to, of course, describe the process 
of surgically altering a Klingon to look like a human. First of all, the fact that it's been done before in the literature, and also just to describe kind of how grotesque, painful, and what it would be like for that Klingon. So if you want to think about what Volk may have gone through. And then I also wanted to get to the part about the medical tests. So this covers the question of surgical alteration and why Arn Darwin looked human, not like a Klingon who had contracted or been intentionally exposed to the augment virus to change his appearance. And we all know what did in Darwin, a tribble. And Lorca has one. I'll be surprised if this doesn't happen, by the way, but I'll also be disappointed in a sense when it does because it's so obvious and it was from the very beginning Hopefully, it will be more interesting than we think. I I have to think the writers are going somewhere a little less obvious. But as I just mentioned, Beneath the Skin also highlights another flaw in the ash Vokler theory, and that's a medical scan. There is no way that a Klingon altered to appear human could pass a thorough medical examination. And that's true for most species. This is what we see Blow Rikers cover in the episode First Contact, when he ends up in a Malkorian hospital. You have to think that Dr. Kolber did a thorough examination of a POW that was rescued and brought aboard his ship. It would seem medical malpractice not to do so. So when Lorca tells Admiral Cornwell that he checked Tyler out, you'd think that would include a medical exam, which means either the captain and the doctor are both negligent Or, Tyler appears to be human on the inside. And if that's the case, there's more going on here than we've seen in past Star Trek. But I really do think Tyler is a Volk. So we'll see how the writers explain it. We've seen characters take on the personality of others because of a body switch. As with Kirk and Janice Lester in Turnabout Intruder, we've seen characters who forgot who they are and take on a new identity such as the Voyager crew in Workforce, and we've seen cases such as Kirk in the Paradise Syndrome, in which a character can't remember who they are. But this would be something new if Volk can so thoroughly be transformed into Ash Tyler, to the point that he thinks he is a human Starfleet officer named Ash Tyler, and has all the memories of that human. Perhaps the closest example that I can think of is one also mentioned by Captain Revo on Twitter when he suggested this planting of a human personality into Volk. In DS9's Second Skin, the Obsidian Order kidnaps Kira and surgically alters her to appear Cardassian. But even this doesn't really mirror what would have to be going on here. In Second Skin, the Cardassians try to convince Kira that she is one of them by telling her that she was surgically altered to look Bajoran so that she could infiltrate the Bajoran resistance, and that her memories were altered so that she would think that she was Bajoran. And now that they have her back, they tell her that she is now being given drugs to reverse this memory alteration. They then tell her all sorts of things about her past in the hopes that she'll buy it because she'll just think that she has no memory of that life, because of the memory alteration. But that's not what is going on here. No one is trying to convince Tyler that he is a human, at least no one on Discovery. It's possible that the Klingons capture the real Ash Tyler, surgically altered and drugged Volk, and while under the influence of those drugs, fed him information that convinced him that he is human, that he is Ash Tyler. That information would have included the backstory of the real Ash Tyler, where he's from, how his mom died, etc. All the things that we've heard so far. It still doesn't explain the language and why he can speak English so naturally. But I think this theory is a very possible one. It seems much more probable after watching Lethe than it did during the previous week. I should mention, by the way, that I got so caught up in Tyler's story of surviving for seven months that I said in the last episode of Notes that Volk had seven months to learn English or polish it to this level. But as listeners Jason Moe in the Babel Conference on Facebook and Rodney on Twitter pointed out to me, Volk was marooned on the Shenzhou for six months. So really, it would have only been three or four weeks 
that he had to be transformed into a human and develop his language skills. I got my times mixed up there. So what I said last week is even more true. If he can't do it in seven months, he certainly can't do it in three weeks. Back to the idea that Tyler doesn't know that he is Volk and that he is on a mission, I do see holes in it. There are little things like facial expressions, the inflection of a comment, or lines such as the one at the end of the episode when he responds to Burnham's question. All my life, the conflict inside me has been between logic and emotion. But now it's my emotions that are fighting. I think about him and I want to cry. But I have to smile. And I feel angry. But I want to love. And I'm hurt, but there's hope. What is this? It's just being human. The way he says that line makes me feel that he knows that he is experiencing what it means to be human in contrast to being Klingon. I don't know. It's just a feeling that I have. It feels like an actor who knows the big picture and is either letting it come through unintentionally or is being directed to drop tiny hints. I may be totally wrong in that. I just kind of got that feeling. It's probably colored by the fact that I think he's folk. I otherwise probably wouldn't pay much attention to anything odd being there. Anyway, just a bit more here on the theory after a week of pondering it that I thought I'd share. I'm really looking forward to seeing where this goes. I think it's quite interesting. It's quite obvious if this is what they're doing. But it's also interesting, and I really hope the plot twists are more than I anticipate. All right, that's my one long thought for this episode. I'll skip going into other characters this time, except to say that I loved Stamets. Tilly was really good in this episode. For the first time, I really liked Tilly. And the food replicator needs to lighten up about nutrition. Okay, let's move on to notes. There are lots of little things here in this episode, and I'm going to start off with another name. The ship that Lorca lost was the USS Baran. Now, at least if you're my age, maybe you remember in the 1980s, the Soviet Union was building a clone of the US space shuttle. Do you remember this ship? I'm sure you've seen pictures of it. Well, that orbiter was named Buran, which means snowstorm or blizzard in Russian. And I just find it kind of interesting because you could say that what has happened to Lorca has been a bit of a blizzard battering his psyche. I have no idea if they named the ship Buran after the Soviet shuttle, but maybe. All right, next up is Grazer. Tyler tells Lorca that his mother was killed while visiting the moons of Grazer. Although this planet has never been mentioned on screen, it is part of Stellar Cartography, the Starfleet Reference Library, by my good friend Larry Nemechek. Although Grazer hasn't been mentioned on screen, the Grazerites have, so I assume Grazer is their homeworld. You probably remember Jaresh Inyo, the Federation president in the DS9 episodes Homefront and Paradise Lost. He was a Grazerite, and he's also in the novel Articles of the Federation by Keith DeCandido. I find the makeup similarities between the Grazerites and the Kelpians, of which Saru is one, interesting. Both are species that grazed, and Saru has hooves, which is the reason why he wears those tall arched boots, and there are also a lot of similarities in the facial features. Although, unlike Jaresh Inyo, Saru doesn't have horns. That's why Jaresh Inyo wore the little cloth on his head to cover the horns. So we've seen grazer rites before. And let's visit one more place while we're on these little small nuggets here, and that's Eurydia. In this episode, 
they go to the Uridia Nebula. In past Star Trek, we've seen plenty of Uridians. Six of them with names and others unnamed for a total of 29 appearances across the four modern live-action series. Mostly on Deep Space Nine. I think 22 of them came from there. Whether this Uridia and the Uridia Nebula in Lethe are a reference to the same is unclear. As in the past, it was only said that they are from the Uridian homeworld. And that was mentioned in Deep Space Nine's Melora. But in Una McCormick's DS9 novel Hollow Men, this homeworld is given the name Uridia. So I'm guessing that this is a reference inserted into Discovery. The Uridians are known as information dealers, and the most notable appearances by a Uridian include Daglom Shrek, the alien who sells information about the alleged fate of Mog to Worf in TNG's Birthright. That's the first appearance by a Uridian. Uranek, who Riker tried to talk to about Picard in Gambit Part 1. Ashrock, the traitor in DS9's Melora. Yog, the freighter captain, who was buying magnesite ore from the Duras sisters in TNG's Firstborn. And then there's Yerdrinlek, who was hired by the Zindi to find the last human colony in Enterprise's Twilight. Like the Grazerites, the Uridians haven't been used much in the literature. Appearing only in Una's Hollow Men, Keith's Starfleet Corps of Engineers War Stories, and the novelization of the Voyager episode Equinox. They also appear, of course, in an RPG model. This time it's Worlds by Decipher, and also in the TNG video game Birth of the Federation. Okay, let's move on to something else, and let's enter the virtual world for a moment and talk about the holodeck. Okay, they didn't call it a holodeck in the episode, But it certainly looks a lot more like a small version of the TNG holodeck than some sort of primitive holographic simulation. It actually looks a lot like a holosuite from DS9 in terms of size, though size never seemed to matter once the program started. When I watched Lethe for the first time and I saw this, I tweeted that this will probably give the naysaying canon police a stroke because they are so often unaware of canon in detail, and believe that because they personally don't remember or know something, it doesn't exist. But there actually is precedent for this prior to TNG, as many of you surely know. In the animated series episode, The Practical Joker, we see that the Enterprise itself had such a room where holographic recreation was possible. And in fact, this was a feature of Constitution-class starships. Obviously, they couldn't do this on the original series for both technological and budgetary reasons, but they could do it in animation. And Gene oversaw both. So given that Discovery is said to be the most advanced ship in the fleet and the Enterprise is in service at the same time, it makes sense that holographic facilities are in use by Starfleet during this time period. And... I'm pretty sure the animated series is the writer's justification for this. You know the actual nature of my mission. This mission does not reflect true Vulcan ideology. You are one of them, a fanatic. Your fascination with humans can no longer be tolerated. Your obsession has blinded you to the truth. Humans are inferior my sacrifice will be a rallying cry to those who value logic above all vulcans will soon recognize and withdraw from the failed experiment known as the federation now let's talk about the vulcans In Lethe, we see Vulcans who are openly racist against non-Vulcans, and on the extreme end, carry out violent acts to stop the integration of humans into their society. This is not new to Star Trek. Connections to the Vulcan isolationist movement were seen on TNG in the two-part story Gambit, and this movement also appeared in the last Unicorn RPG modules, Gambit, and All Our Yesterdays, the Time Travel Sourcebook. But otherwise, it hasn't been expanded upon in the literature to my knowledge. 
But I also see the logic extremists as a continuation of the Cyrenites, the group seen in the 22nd century on Enterprise, that believed that Vulcan society had moved away from logic and the teachings of Sirach. Unlike Litavik and the group he represents in Lethe, however, the Cyrenites were not violent. Despite attempts by the Vulcan High Command to frame them for the bombing of the United Earth Embassy on Vulcan in the episode The Forge. Now, the reason I say it reminds me of them, even though they're not violent, and I don't think the Cyrenites were racist either, is simply the fact that they felt that Vulcan society had moved away from logic. And I feel like that's the same point being made in a different way by the logic extremists, because they feel that Sarek's fascination with humans, his experiment with Spock, as it's called in this episode, and also with Michael Burnham, is something he shouldn't be doing. And also the job at the Federation at the end as a failed experiment. They don't want to be a part of it, because humans obviously aren't logical, And moving away from logic is not where Vulcan society should go. So maybe it's a little bit of a loose connection, but I think it sort of all ties together as a pattern through Vulcan society. And the Vulcans are not as uh, open to the outside as we might expect from such an enlightened race. So another point about Vulcans that I want to talk about, and this is the main point here for the rest of notes, is the concept of the Katra, or the living spirit. It plays an important role in that Enterprise three-parter that involves the Sirenites, the Forge, Awakening, and Kirishara. When we say Katra, most Star Trek fans think first of the search for Spock and retroactively the end of the Wrath of Khan, when Spock, knowing he will likely die, transfers his Katra, or living spirit, to Dr. McCoy. But if we roll back the timeline, so we're going to go in universe here, the first time we encounter the idea of the Katra is in the fourth season of Enterprise, in the Vulcan trilogy that I've been talking about. Did your mother tell you the story? Of the Ida? Infinite diversity, in infinite combination. Words that are a mere shadow of its true meaning. Sirach tells us that the story of the Idic has no end. But it begins here, at Mount Soleil. Sirach died on Mount Soleil. His body, yes. But his katra was spirited away before the last battle against those who marched beneath the raptor's wings. Those who wanted to return to the savage ways. What's a katra? Serenites claim it's the essence of a Vulcan mind, that it can be transferred from the body before death, then stored in some manner. Some say Serac's Katra was found, and now is carried by a Serenite, so all those who meld with him may touch Serac's mind. Serenites conduct mind melding? Serac tells us it is the heritage of every Vulcan. even those who don't believe in the practice. So although we have to wait until the 82nd episode of Enterprise for this to happen, we almost got it in the 6th. The first draft of the script for the Andorian incident explained that Katric arcs were used to store Katras, and the Pajam Monastery was home to many of these arcs. It makes me think of Buddhist temples in Japan, where... In a corridor behind the Butsuden, that's the main hall that houses the statue of Buddha, you may find rows of stone memorials to past monks of the temple, in some cases stretching back thousands of years. It also makes me think of how, even today, we keep the ashes of the deceased in urns. Although we don't get the Katric arcs at Pajim in the Andorian incident, or Shadows of Pajim, it is finally mentioned in Awakening, the second part of that trilogy, that they were found there. At Pajim. Katric arcs were stored in a hall of arcs within monasteries. So the first transfer of a Katra to a human that we know of was when Sirach's Katra was briefly passed to Captain Archer in a continuation of the story from which I just played dialogue. The next time we see it, which was really the first time in 1968, 
is in Return to Tomorrow on the original series when Spock's Katra is transferred to Nurse Chapel. You're alive. There was enough poison in that hypo to kill ten Vulcans. No, Doctor. I allowed you to believe that to be true so that Henock would read your thoughts and believe it also. Sargon. It seems, Doctor, the injection was only enough to cause unconsciousness. But Henock believed and fled the body. He is destroyed. But your vessel was destroyed, too. Where was your consciousness kept? The place Henock would least suspect, Captain. That is why I was summoned into sick bay, Doctor. Mr. Spock's consciousness was placed in me. It's not called a katra, but that's what it was. Then, not to be left out, just because it is a cartoon, the animated series got in on the Katra action in the episode The Infinite Vulcan, when Dr. Stavos Caniclius V, a clone, the fourth obviously of a human geneticist from the eugenics wars, tries to clone Spock to create Spock II. But again, the term Katra isn't used. It's no use, Jim. He'll be dead in a few minutes. His mind is gone. He no longer thinks. This machine has drained his mind somehow. More than just drained. It's been transferred. Relocated into the mechanism itself. I can duplicate exact physiological structure. I cannot duplicate that which is learned. Just as my predecessor transferred his knowledge to me through this apparatus, I have done that with Mr. Spock and the first of his clones. You talk about creating life with your clones. But you have to murder to do it. Come on. I don't think he understands. His mind is still trying to assimilate all the knowledge it's been fed. The next time after this, which I feel is the one that really gave birth to the idea in terms of storytelling, despite the earlier TOS and TAS references, is Spock passing his Katra to Bones at the end of Star Trek II and then Sarek coming in to talk to Kirk about it in Star Trek III. And this is when it is first given a proper name. That's a moment that's just burned in my memory from growing up, watching The Search for Spock over and over. But I also had all the Star Trek movies recorded on audio tape, and I would play them in the car as I'm driving around town. And so I've heard Sarek say that so many times. It really is burned into my brain. All right, moving along, the concept of the Katra was also discussed by Dax and Bashir, again, not by name, in the first season of DS9 in The Passenger. Here's the hypothesis. The body dies, the consciousness lives on. In another brain? Possible. Well, the closest thing I've encountered is synaptic pattern displacement, but that's never been done by a non-Vulcan. I'm convinced Vantico is working on it. There are over 70 different computer simulations in his file. All involve identifying neural energy patterns and storing them in different areas of the brain. But Katra was specifically mentioned in the second season Voyager episode, Innocence. The scrolls say we should be happy that when we die, the energy inside us is set free. Is it true? Is that what really happens? Vulcans believe that a person's Katra what some might call a soul, continues to exist after the body dies. Do you believe that? When I was younger, I accepted it without question. In recent years, I have experienced doubts. I do believe there is more within each of us than science has yet explained. Now you might be asking, where's the TNG reference? Sarah and Picard. Well, that was just a mind meld, not a transfer of Katra. So that one's not in here. In the literary universe, because I do like to go over there, the Katra has been mentioned a few times, but you know, it's in fewer novels than you might think. There's Sarek by A.C. Crispin, Exodus and Exiles by Josepha Sherman and Susan Schwartz, books one and two of the Vulcan's Soul trilogy, so of course you'd expect that it would be mentioned there, right? William Shatner's Avenger, The Lost Years by J.M. Dillard, the Vanguard novel Harbinger by David Mack, the TNG novel Possession by J.M. Dillard and Kathleen O'Malley, and the novelization of Star Trek V The Final Frontier. It also turns up in two comics, Starfleet Academy number 15, Origins from Marvel, 
which involves Nog, so this is a 24th century story, and DC's the original series number 28, The Last Word, which is a TOS film era story written by Diane Duane. And, not to be left out, of course, role-playing games, Last Unicorn Games, released an RPG module in 1998 called The Way of Kolinar, The Vulcans. A title which makes me wonder what else they would do. The Way of Kolinar, The Ferengi. The Way of Kolinar, The Packlids. I don't know why they need to have Vulcans on there, but okay. So, the Katra is a mainstay in Star Trek, and it has been ever since Chapel sheltered Spock from Hinnock in Return to Tomorrow. Even though it has been revisited only occasionally, I think it's one of those things that we feel as fans is always there. It's such an important part of the Vulcan identity. It's true, Discovery is certainly doing some new things with the concept. And for some people, it might be a little hard to swallow what they're doing with Katras and mind melds, creating Seric vision, as Stamets would say. But it's all so mystical in the first place that there is certainly room for new ideas about how it works and how strong the bond can be between two people who have shared this life force. It's groovy. All right, so those are my notes from The Edge for week six of Star Trek Discovery. Be sure to check out our Discovery coverage throughout the week. On Monday nights, Brandy and Bruce go live on YouTube with Live from The Edge, and you can take part in the show by interacting with them on Twitter or through chat. And if you can't join live, don't worry, you can still listen to the show on Tuesday morning when it is released as a podcast. Commentary tracks will be available each Wednesday as Tracks from the Edge. We'll discuss your feedback on Postcards from the Edge on Thursday. And of course, you can catch full analysis on the Edge main show on Friday. And then I'll be wrapping things up each week here on Notes from the Edge on Saturdays, sometimes Sundays, with this kind of deep dive into links between Discovery and the broader franchise. And you'll find all of these in the main feed for the Edge and in the Trek Film Master feed. We'd love to hear your thoughts on Discovery and the things I talked about today. The best place to do that is in the Babel Conference, our listeners group on Facebook, where Amy Nelson will collect your feedback for postcards from The Edge. You can also find us on Twitter at TrekFM or send us email using the contact form on our website at trek.fm slash contact. Choose to send to a show and choose The Edge, and that'll come to all the hosts by email. And if you'd like to find me personally, I'd love to hear from you. You can find me there in the Babel Conference, of course, but perhaps the best place to converse with me is on Twitter. My username is C Brian Jones. That's the letter C and Brian with a Y. And that's my name pretty much everywhere in social media. C Brian Jones. If you'd like to hear me discuss Star Trek Beyond Discovery, you can catch my main show, The Ready Room, on which we cycle through TOS through Enterprise and loop back around. So every sixth show, we're back to the original series, and we do special shows sometimes as well. The last few shows have been about Discovery, but if you go back, you'll get plenty of variety. I've been doing The Ready Room since early 2011, and there are 216 episodes for you in the back catalog. I also co-host The Orb, our Deep Space Nine podcast with Matthew Rushing, and you can find my writing about Star Trek on the official website at StarTrek.com. I'd also like to take a moment and thank our associate producers of The Edge, Norman C. Lau, Tony Robinson, Lisa Slack, Tom Puleo, Shoei Mertza, and Richard Rutledge. Thank you so much, guys, for your support. We really, honestly, could not keep The Edge or any of our podcasts going without your support. So I really do appreciate it from the bottom of my heart. And I hope other people will join as well. You don't have to become an associate producer. Any amount you can contribute makes a difference for our ability to cover our bill for production, hosting, and distribution. We use a lot of bandwidth. We're pushing, I think this month, we're going to go over eight terabytes of data that we're pushing out to everyone. So it really does help a lot. And if you'd like to help us out, or become an AP, or join the Patrons Roundtable and talk Star Trek with some of our hosts and fellow listeners, or have access to Patron Zone, our special website for patrons. You can find out everything you need to know by visiting patreon.com slash trekfm. 
That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash Trek FM. You'll find out everything you need to know there, and I really do appreciate it. I hope you'll join us. Well, that's all I have for you this time. It was a bit of a long show, so thank you for hanging in there with me. I hope you found it interesting, and I hope you'll join me again next time as we jot down more notes right on the paper's edge. (laughs) 